in World News Tonight. Looming invasions. Russia rejects diplomacy in their latest defense against possible military tensions at the Ukraine border, while the U.S. continues to keep a lid on the possibility of war in the region. Tonight, more on the skyrocketing tensions. Lending a hand. Tonga finally receives aid from around the world as the archipelago struggles to cope with the scale of the destruction caused. One year done. Despite the hurdles faced, Biden powers through an year of leading America, celebrating the anniversary with a fiery news conference. The US president is hopeful of the year ahead. What are his hopes and plans for the future of the nation? Find out tonight. And illuminating falls. The graceful Niagara Falls gets a touch of color to accentuate the mighty flow of water, giving rise to a work of art on a massive scale. This is Ada Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We begin tonight's broadcast with a look at the ever-increasing tensions between Russia and the United States. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said that Russia could launch a new attack on Ukraine at very short notice, but Washington would pursue diplomacy as long as it could, even though it was unsure what Moscow really wants. Russia's demands are not clear. That is according to the United States top diplomat at a press conference in Kiev on Wednesday. It's not clear what uh, Russia's central demand is uh, or is not. They put a number of things uh, on the table. Some of them are clearly absolute non-starters, like closing NATO's door to, to new members. Uh, other things, as I said, if it goes to actually uh, you know, enhancing everyone's security uh, on a reciprocal basis. Secretary of State Antony Blinken arrived in Kiev earlier that day for meetings with Ukraine's president and foreign minister, addressing Russia's massive troop buildup near Ukraine's border. With tens of thousands of Russian troops on the Ukrainian border, tensions with the West have reached a post-Cold War high. Several nations, including the US and the UK, have upped military aid to Kiev. Ukraine has doubled down on its desire to avoid conflict with its neighbors. Ukraine не хоче війни, але Україна повинна завжди бути готовою до неї. Не боїться, бо захищає свою землю. Не здасться, бо це наша земля. Тікати нікуди. Moscow insists it has no plans to invade, but is demanding wide-ranging security guarantees in exchange for lowering tensions. We will not attack, strike, invade, quote-unquote, whatever, Ukraine. On Thursday, Blinken will travel to Berlin for talks with European allies. Then, a head-to-head -head is scheduled with his Russian counterpart, Sergei Lavrov, in Geneva on Friday. One seen as a test of Russia's willingness to resolve this crisis diplomatically. Tonga may be out of the woods as far as rescue operations go as multiple countries have finally supplied aid to the country. Alongside the aid, the island nation has also successfully re-established some communication sectors as well. The first planes carrying aid reached Tonga five days after the island nation was hit by a volcanic eruption and tsunami. Australian and New Zealand aircraft touched down with water treatment gear, shelter, kitchens and a sweeper to remove ash from the airport. The delivery of the supplies was contactless to ensure Tonga remains free of the coronavirus. Over 100,000 people have been cut off from the rest of the world for days. The disaster severed an undersea telecoms cable that was one of the few links to the outside. Tongan lawmaker Fatifahe Fakafanua said he was relieved to hear from his family after telephone lines were partially restored. Footage has emerged of the aftermath, showing ash-covered debris and trees torn from their roots. At least three people were killed as the tsunami waves rolled across the archipelago. One local journalist told the blast was deafening. Australia's High Commissioner to Tonga said the loss of property had been catastrophic and that most home water tanks were filled with dust, not safe for drinking. 
She also said villages on the western side of Tonga were very badly hit and that there was only enough food to last a few weeks. Two more ships from New Zealand with supplies are to arrive on Friday and another from Australia setting sail on the same day. With potential war looming between Russia and Ukraine and COVID still ravaging the United States, President Joe Biden makes a self-assessment of his first year in office. In a nearly two-hour news conference, the president appeared to hit the reset button as he begins his second year in office. He vows to get out of the White House more and seek more outside advice. The president's also enumerating accomplishment, lower unemployment while acknowledging rising inflation and not being able to be on top of COVID testing in the earlier days. Tonight, President Biden struggling with soaring inflation, a stalled agenda and sinking approval ratings is searching for a reset. In his first solo White House news conference in nearly a year, the president pointing to the pandemic. Still, for all this progress, I know there's a lot of frustration and fatigue in this country. And we know why. COVID-19. The president touting more than 200 million Americans fully vaccinated. But COVID is still surging despite this campaign pledge. I'm going to shut down the virus, not the country. Just this week, some Democratic senators calling out the president for failing to take more significant steps earlier to increase testing. Should we have done more testing earlier? Yes. But we're doing more now. Some people may call what's happening now the new normal. I call it a job not yet finished. It will get better. On inflation at a 40-year high, with prices soaring on everything from gasoline to groceries, the president again touted his massive social spending and climate bill. The bottom line, if price increases are what you're worried about, the best answer is my Build Back Better plan. But that legislation has stalled. So has Democrats' voting rights legislation. President Biden unable to get his own party on board. Still, the president is blaming Republicans. I did not anticipate that there'd be such a stalwart effort to make sure that the most important thing was that President Biden didn't get anything done. Think about this. What are Republicans for? What are they for? He was asked about the impact if Democrats' voting bills fail. Whether or not we're able to make the case to the American people that some of this is being set up to try to alter the outcome of the election. I think if, in fact, no matter how hard they make it for minorities to vote, I think you're going to see them willing to stand in line and, and defy the attempt to keep them from being able to vote. And asked about the president's promise to unify the country with criticism of this recent speech where he blamed Americans who disagreed with Democrats voting bills. Do you want to be the side on the side of Dr. King or George Wallace? Do you want to be on the side of John Lewis or Bull Connor? Do you want to be on the side of Abraham Lincoln or Jefferson Davis? I did not say that there were going to be a George Wallace or a Bull Connor. I said, we're going to have a decision in history. Based on some of the stuff we've got done, I'd say yes, but it's not nearly unified as it should be. Now to the investigation of the January 6th Capitol attack in the United States. The Supreme Court rejects former U.S. President Donald Trump's request to block the release of White House records to congressional investigators. The decision means the records can be disclosed even as lawsuits over the documents continue in lower courts. And there are new allegations of fraud against Trump and his organization. New York's Attorney General Letitia James says former President Trump and two of his children were in charge of the Trump Organization when misleading financial statements were issued to lenders and the federal government. We have uncovered significant evidence, she writes, that suggests Donald J. Trump and the Trump Organization falsely and fraudulently valued multiple assets for economic benefit. For example, the filing points to financial statements that suggest the value of the former president's New York City apartment in Trump Tower was based on an assertion it was 30,000 square feet. These documents allege it was closer to 11,000, overvalued by about $200 million. 
It's a civil investigation, not criminal. The new filing is in response to legal efforts by the former president to quash a series of subpoenas against him and his family. It's a political persecution. Today, the Trump organization fired back, saying Letitia James defrauded New Yorkers by basing her entire candidacy on a promise to get Trump at all costs without having seen a shred of evidence. Her allegations are baseless and will be vigorously defended. It's going to short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back to World News Tonight. French members of the European Parliament seized a rare opportunity to attack President Emmanuel Macron directly three months before France's presidential election. Macron was appearing before the Assembly in Strasbourg to set out France's priorities for its six-month EU presidency. But French lawmakers were much more interested in debating his domestic policies. We have other than a World News Special Correspondent Chetana Dharmaratna who joins us now from Normandy in France to give us the latest. Chetana, over to you. Yes, Shanali, the parliament's new chair, Roberta Metzelo of Malta, said that this is not a national debate, as she struggled in vain to move the focus back to EU matters. In France, a president never takes part in debate in the National Assembly, and having to respond live to lawmakers' questions is a highly unusual affair. Manon Aubry of the hard left La France in Somme, France unbubbed, accused him of arrogance, impotence, and shaming. Macron, who has already made clear he wants to run for a second mandate, but has yet to officially confirm it, accused his opponents of misunderstanding the challenges facing Europe and France and misrepresenting his policies. Opinion polls show Macron is most likely winner of the April election, but that it's not a done deal. A staunch pro-European, Macron is hoping his proposals for a more active Europe will help secure him a second five-year term as French president. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Adhidharana World News Special Correspondent Chetana Dharmaratna reporting from Normandy in France. The pandemic and the cessation from the EU has not been merciful to the British economy. The United Kingdom saw its inflation rate spike far quicker and higher than expected and in turn this has increased both the cost of living and domestic interest rates. These are tough times as of now but experts predict that it's only going to get tougher. Britons are beginning to feel the squeeze on living standards. New figures Wednesday showed inflation jumping to 5.4% in December, its highest in nearly 30 years. Prices for food, hospitality and household goods were the main factors. Fuel prices, which were the key driver in previous months, remained at their recent highs. Now all eyes will be on the Bank of England. The soaring cost of living is putting pressure on the BOE to raise its main interest rate again. Last month it became the first major central bank to tighten policy since the start of the global health crisis. Interest rates rose to a quarter of a percent in December, with financial markets pricing in a more than 90% chance that interest rates will increase to half a percent in February. And further pressure is expected on inflation in April, when a cap on energy prices will go up and household energy bills could rise by as much as 50%. Many economists now think price rises could hit 7%. And it's all a mounting problem for the government, which faces growing calls to offset the rise in energy bills. We have some good news for you. Statistically, the African continent is one of the most under-vaccinated regions in the world. South African and American businessman Patrick Sungcheong, together with the president of South Africa, spoke up and the inequality in vaccine distribution around the world. As such, the billionaire opened a new vaccine plant in Cape Town to help produce and vaccinate the people of Africa, not just against COVID-19, but against all diseases that require vaccination. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa and billionaire businessman Patrick Soon Shiong cut the ribbon on a new vaccine plant on Wednesday. The Cape Town facility is intended to help Soon Shiong's Nant SA make COVID-19 shots in the future and address the continent's dearth in manufacturing capacity. 
Ramaphosa said Africa should no longer be last in line to access vaccines against pandemics. Africa should no longer go cap in hand to the Western world begging and begging for vaccines that they just want to drip off from their tables. We will stand on our own. The pandemic has exposed unequal access to vaccines across the world. Just around 10% of people in Africa are fully vaccinated, compared to more than half in the global population. The new plant will also work on vaccines targeting cancer, TB and HIV. This is a momentous day for us. South African-American Soon Xiong, who is also a medical doctor, will transfer technology and materials from his California-based Nantworks. So the idea is these are the kinds of 21st century technologies that as we implement manufacturing in South Africa by South Africans for South Africans and be leapfrog of the rest of the world. To ensure a pipeline of skilled workers, Soon Xiong has pledged $6.5 million for scholarships. The first production of vaccines is expected for later this year. And the aim is to produce 1 billion COVID-19 vaccine doses by 2025. Norwegian mass murderer Andres Breivik arrived in court for the final day of the parole hearing that will decide if he should be re released after spending more than a decade behind bars. He held up a sign before being seated. Breivik, a far-right extremist, killed 77 people in Norway's worst peacetime atrocity in July 2011. He killed eight with a car bomb in Oslo and then gunned down 69, most of them teenagers, at a Labour Party youth camp. The 42-year-old neo-Nazi is serving Norway's maximum sentence of 21 years, which can be extended indefinitely if he is deemed to continue threat to the society. But after a decade in prison, he is entitled to apply for parole. In a rambling monologue to the court, Breivik argued that there is a distinction between militant and non-militant white nationalists and said that he had been brainwashed by the former when he carried out his attacks in Oslo and at a summer retreat on Utaya Island. Breivik didn't express any remorse, saying that only that he cries for victims on both sides in what he described as a culture war. French actor Gaspard Ulliel, who became world known for playing Yves Saint Laurent in 2014 biopic, died at the age of 37 from injuries from a skiing accident. Dubbed one of the greatest talents of his generation, actor Gaspard Ulliel died at the age of 37 following a skiing accident the day before. He was spending time with family in the La Rosière resort in the French Alps. Born in Paris, the actor first appeared on our screens as a teenager, with his breakthrough role coming in the 2003 film Strayed. He continued to enhance his reputation with a role in the film A Very Long Engagement, for which he was awarded the César Award for Most Promising Actor. Over the following two decades, he appeared alongside some of the biggest names in French cinema, he continued to receive adulation for his work, winning the César Award for Best Actor in 2017 in It's Only the End of the World by Xavier Dolan. News of his death has been greeted with shock and sadness in his home country. On Twitter, actor Pierre Nini said, Broken heart, Gaspar was benevolence and kindness, beauty and talent, thoughts to his family. The French Minister of Culture, Joseline Bachelot, also paid tribute to him. His sensitivity and the intensity of his acting made Gaspar Ulliel an exceptional actor. Cinema today is losing an immense talent. I send my condolences to his loved ones and my loving thoughts to those who mourn him today. Ulliel also made a mark on the international stage, gaining attention for his performance as the famous cannibal in Hannibal Rising in 2007. He had recently been cast to appear in the upcoming Marvel series, Moon Knight. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Ukraine's former president Petro Poroshenko won a court ruling allowing him to remain at liberty while being investigated for treason in a probe he says was trumped by allies of his successor, President Vladimir Zelensky. 
UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson announced that mandatory face mask rules will be lifted in Britain from January 27th. In addition, COVID-19 vaccine passports will no longer be required for large events and gatherings and people can return to their offices. The easing comes as infections across many parts of the country have levelled off. The United States is calling on China to fully implement UN Security Council sanctions against North Korea but adds that it strongly supports humanitarian assistance for the North Korean people. The UAE envoy revealed more details on the attack in the UAE orchestrated by Yemen's Houthi rebels. The nature of the explosives used, the locations targeted and the inception of certain missiles were discussed. However, certain details have still been left out of the public eye due to security concerns. The 2022 Grammy Awards is rescheduled to take place on April 3rd and for the first time ever it will be held in Las Vegas. The event was postponed due to a surge in Omicron variant. This is the second straight year it's been postponed due to the pandemic. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow on more news around the globe. In case you have missed to watch any of the stories that we aired tonight, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. We are leaving you tonight with spectacular visuals of the Grand Niagara Falls bathed in a rainbow of color. Thank you for joining us. Have a good night.